Hey everybody, welcome to Sunday night. If you are watching this at the scheduled six o'clock time on Sundays, I am not live tonight. Uh, Lachlan is traveling home from Kansas City with her boys, and so we are just gonna give a virtual update on how she's doing. Um, I would love it if uh, you could give her a little shout out. This is her handle on, uh, on Instagram, and she is a single mom driving six hours, so, um, if you uh, get, just give her a shout out because today she is starting a fast. On Sundays, I try to start a fast every week in hopes to reach an autophagy of uh, uh, at least once a week that I can measure. I do a ketogenic diet throughout the week, but on Sundays try to uh, watch my numbers to a Dr. Boz ratio of 40. Uh, Lachlan, our type 1 diabetic, is now in our fourth month of consultations every week, getting her sugars down and watching um, the struggles that happen on a type 1 diabetic's journey. Uh, she has been incredibly gracious with how transparent she's been, and, and the success has been just overwhelming. Last night I attended a, a gala for type 1 diabetics in children and just making sure that uh, the it's actually a local foundation here in my city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where um, a mom had a type 1 diabetic uh, diagnosed at 5 and followed all the rules, did everything the American Diabetic Association said, was gung-ho for her kid and found herself in a mess three years later with sugars going up and down she since uh, went against the grain and did uh, a ketogenic diet and really has created a tidal wave of support for kids. So last night we attended um, uh, that in support of uh, Let Me Be 83, which is the organization for type 1 uh, diabetics in kids. And I just want to say congratulations for a great um, uh, conference on Friday and a great uh, information on type 1 diabetics for what, how they can use a low-carb diet. Um, I do have a very uh, common question that I wanted to answer. I was going to do it with Lachlan, but I'm going to do it just with you. Um, and then uh, just want to say one more time, if you use that uh, handle for Instagram, the next uh, 36 hours, Lachlan is going to be fasting. So if you can give her words of encouragement, it really does help. Um, I'm in here on a Sunday uh, and I you know, quickly saw a patient and did um, just some cleanup things, not feeling my best today. I think it was because I had a dessert last night that had a sugar substitute that does not agree with me. <laughs> if you've uh, read my book any way you can, there's a fantastically uh, telling story about a craving I had um, and went uh, into the kitchen and just uh, Googled how to convert this to a low-carb dessert. And man, I paid for that like for two days. So these uh, sugar substitutes, some of them are great. Some of them do not sit well with me. Uh, and I feel, I'm totally feeling punk. And I, I didn't even have a, a drop of wine. I, I knew I was fasting today and was going to be checking my numbers. And I don't just have found that uh, uh, even if I have a, a glass of wine on Saturday nights, uh, when I do that, I just don't feel as well. I didn't even do that. And I feel kind of punk. So uh, I'm going to be starting my fast. And I would bet if I had to look in the crystal ball that my numbers will not be so good. I just don't feel great. So um, there's nothing like a little uh, green tea and um, I actually put a few ketones in here because I just don't feel great. But um, I'm going to carry on and do what I tell my patients to do, which is even when you're not feeling well, try to do the things that we know work well. One of them is fasting always does make me feel better. Um, I do um, find that I get better energy by the second day. If I'm feeling low, I will supplement with some ketones, which I did. And um, then uh, do what it is that makes you feel good, which I love teaching. And so here we are. Um, I'm using today's uh, um, uh, broadcast as a way to answer one of the most common questions I've been getting for about a month. Um, I actually am working on writing another book with more advanced lessons of ketosis. If you're a beginner in a, in a ketogenic diet, I highly recommend that you buy the book I wrote any way you can. These are the basic lessons of a ketogenic diet that I've uh, woven into my mom's story when she was fighting cancer at 71. Much like my channel, I use real patient stories to teach the science of how this uh, medical uh, uh, approach to better health works. Uh, ketogenic diets are not rocket science, but they do have lots of questions and there's lots of myths out there. And I try to be sticking to the front lines, trying to find uh, as much of the uh, um, research papers I can to support 
how I come up with my decisions, but clinical practice is also a big part of how this works. So I am going to use this week, um, we're going to start with some basics. I'm going to use the slide deck again I've got prepared. And then if you could do me a favor, um, again, this is going to be a part of what goes in my next book. So this is kind of source material for the, one of the chapters on why, Doc, why are my sugars still high? Um, I've been doing everything you said. Why are my sugars still high? And so I would love to know what you think of this information. Obviously, it's not written form yet, but these are the thoughts that are going into a chapter. So um, just like Lachlan, I need encouragement to just say, is this worth a chapter? Does this matter to people? Um, and I totally depend on how the response goes when I put out a video. So if you could help me by saying, eh, skip it, <laughs> doesn't need to be in the book, um, or no, nope, that was a good explanation. So let's, uh, let's hit play and see how this turns out. All right, so um, we are going to start with, uh-oh, I didn't start at the beginning. Let's try that again. Uh, we are going to start at the top. Uh, let's uh, sneak peek at what's coming ahead. And it's called foreshadowing in writing. <laughs> all right, so this uh, is about why is my glucose so high? So we talk all the time about how this diet is about um, changing the inflammation in your system, really addressing chronic illness by re reducing sugars that have been high, um, and and mainly uh, the unchecked chemical that is being impacted by a, a ketogenic uh, low-carb diet is your insulin. So um, we're going to go forward and say uh, one of the fastest ways to kind of get your head around um, what we're looking for as we study these chemistries is to use something called the Dr. Boz ratio. Uh, I've used this several times in other videos, and um, even uh, there will be a different chapter altogether explaining the Dr. Boz ratio, but I am going to review it here for those that haven't seen it. And I just think the driving home what it is I'm doing, why I'm measuring this, is super important. When we look at the Dr. Boz ratio, um, we are taking your glucose and dividing by ketones. Um, these two biomarkers really help me do an approximation of your body chemistry um, by looking at what the what the overall number is over time and by checking this number several times throughout your ketogenic journey um, we're actually really looking at what is your insulin so by looking at um, these two numbers at the same point in time it gives me several points along the way to see what do I think your insulin is doing so let's take a moment for those of you new to this to um, to see what, what does it mean to have a Dr. Boz ratio uh, and what's that all about. So when I look at the, um, the, uh, this chart that we're going to talk about, you'll see that in the background I have this very inflamed um, character with an eye on his forehead and he looks really mad. Uh, that is my representation of insulin. And I know people give me a bad time for demonizing insulin, but boy, I run a chronic disease management and I take care of folks in the later decades of life where, boy, if I could erase one thing for years of their life, it would have been excessive amounts of insulin. So um, I, I draw him that way, and there's only a few pictures I've ever had where he's not inflamed, because <laughs> that's when he's normal. But most of the time, there's excessive amounts of insulin in my patients. Um, and it's not something I send them to the lab to do. The insulin changes a lot. It's really expensive. And I find that when they are checking these numbers, their ownership of the problem is much better. So we're going to use some examples here. This person's glucose was 97, and then I specifically put on there that their, um, the other metrics used for measuring glucose uh, is millimoles per, de per deciliter, excuse me, millimoles per liter. And that's actually uh, a factor of 18, so 97 divided by 18 is 5.3. Uh, this is, again, what's used in a lot of the research articles. If you go out and you search, is there a research paper done on the Dr. Boz ratio? It's not. It's something I use clinically, I used with my mom, but it is based off of the numbers you find in the glucose ketone index. And we're going to explain why I, why I chose to come up with the Dr. Boz ratio. So this patient's ketones at the time were 1.2. So if you take 97 and you divide by 1.2, their Dr. Boz ratio was 80. Uh, let's just take a quick second to look at what their GKI index was, or GKI, which is glucose ketone index. And if you do a Google search of Thomas Seafried, uh, he's the one who I, I learned from. Uh, and they use this in the protocols for cancer patients and for seizure patients to get them in therapeutic levels. What they're looking for is a glucose ketone ratio. 
And so in this case, um, the, the ketone ratio needs to be 1.0 in order for you to, to be able to do the math right. So in this patient, she would have had a 5.3, which is the millimoles per liter of the glucose. Um, it, it is, uh, and the other part of that ratio was the 1.2 ketones. But in order to get to the scientific paper, you still need to get that ketone down to the a common denominator of 1.0. So that would change that ratio of 4.5 to 1. Okay, that's a lot, just hang in there. Um, what that's really looking at is there for every one ketone, they were looking at 4.5 glucose um, molecules um, in, the, in a millimole per liter. So that's really sciencey, but again, it is based in science and that's how we're using this. It's just much easier. My mom was really sick when we were doing this and she was like, ratios, common denominators, not doing that. So she was too sick and so are a lot of my patients. So this just is a lot easier way and is a way to translate what does this mean. So if you get that um, Dr. Bosch ratio under 80, I call that a weight loss zone. So here's another example. Again, glucose was 100. Um, if you do the calculations for what's the millimole per liter, that's 5.5. Their ketones were one and a half, so that's pretty good. And so if you take the 100 and you divide by 1.5, you got 66. And that's a pretty good Dr. Boz ratio. It's under 80, so I would put that in the weight loss zone. You can see the GKI in that next column there. The last one, or there's a couple more. Um, this one was a glucose of 75. Again, there's that correlating other glucose. Here's the ketone, and the Dr. Boz ratio was 83. So that would be close to uh, what I would call a weight loss zone. So I put it in nearly the weight loss zone. Um, a couple more. Um, the... The glucose here was 88, ketones were 1.1, so that puts you at a Dr. Boz ratio of um, 80, and a GKI of 4.4 to 1, another weight loss zone. And then I call this zone, where the Dr. Boz ratio is less than 40, um, an immune repair. So again, we're really looking at chronic disease, um, and many of my chronic disease patients suffer with autoimmune problems, or their immune system isn't working right. Uh, you can go back into the book and see that Grandma Rose's cancer was of her white blood cells. So her immune system was, it was shot. She, had, she was on antibiotics 50 out of 52 weeks before we started the ketogenic diet. Uh, that next year, she did the reverse. She was on antibiotics only a couple of weeks, and that was, a, that was miraculous. I could not believe how quickly I could resurrect her white blood cells by just decreasing the sugar, decreasing the inflammation by decreasing her insulin, which is, again, what the Dr. Boz ratio is about. The last one is, is a, what I would call the critical care zone. And again, this Thomas Seafried goes into this in his book, um, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, and they use that GKI of a one-to-one. -one. That is an incredibly strict uh, ketogenic, um, ketogenic uh, diet uh, that is uh, usually um, a five-to-one ratio of uh, uh, fat to carbs plus protein. So uh, the that's another probably another video actually so it's an incredibly strict very limited amount of um, um, carbohydrates and protein and actually calorie restricted in that zone too so when grandma rose was really sick when i'm taking care of somebody who has cancer and they want to they want to help uh, their oncology team by you know metabolically en enhancing their system we reach for this ratio it is incredibly difficult and i really recommend that you are under medical supervision but this is what we would call a prescribed diet um, I think a diet of a ketogenic diet should be prescribed by all physicians. I think we should all understand how powerful it is that we can change the health of, of patients by using this. But there is a prescribed ketogenic diet, which is a working for a GKI, a glucose ketone index of one to one, which is a Dr. Boz ratio of less than 20. Those are for seizure patients. Um, those are for um, the, the, the cancer protocols where they use it. Um, and again, Medical supervision, highly recommended. Let's just do a flash through this. So this is, again, that ratio of saying, what is it about this that lowers it? Um, here's just a few more examples saying, here is your glucose of 140. The ketones were 0.7, and that gave you a ratio of 200. So you probably wouldn't be losing weight then. You wouldn't be working on your immune system. But if you do the next set of numbers, that gets you down to 150. Again, not bad, but still, that's kind of not going to get you somewhat much repair, and it's going to be harder to lose weight at that. 
um, you're going to have a tough time seeing results. The next one's a pretty easy math equation. We have a, a glucose of 80 and the ketones were 1, so that puts your Dr. Boz ratio at 80. And again, there's a pretty solid chat, chance that you're going to be in a weight loss zone, that your insulin is low enough to open up your fat storage, um, and that's a powerful um, predictor in my clinic, but also um, in the research by saying when you get that ratio uh, to this, it really is a weight loss zone. Next, we have uh, two situations where the glucose was 68. Uh, the first one, the ketone was only 1.7, and that gave them a ratio of 40. Again, that would hit that Dr. Boz ratio. If you kept that glucose at 68 and you got the ketones up to 3.4, that's how it would look if you got to the Dr. Boz ratio of the critical care, the cancer patients or my seizure patients. All right, so this is getting back to why do I why am I bringing this up? Uh, there's a ton of uh, folks out there that have been asking, Dr. Bosworth, you've so, shown me how to get these ketones higher. I've got pretty good ketones, especially if I fast, but I can't seem to get my glucose down, or I haven't eaten in 36 hours. Why is my glucose still high? And we're going to go through some of that. I want you to take a look at this chart goes through um, looking at what happens as we lower your glucose and what kind of hormonal things show up. So along this line, I picked um, looking at some of the research saying, what can I predict is triggered at different levels of glucose? Now, these people were not on a ketogenic diet, so you're going to see some symptoms that I do not feel when my blood sugars get into the 50s. Um, but uh, without a ketogenic diet, um, without being keto adapted, you, these, are, these are common. So first of all, the easy one is when you get your glucose to 80 or less, your insulin decreases. That's why on that Dr. Boz ratio, if I can get a ratio of... Um, uh, 80 or less, I'm really confident that their insulin lowered probably before uh, this moment. But uh, that is a, the insulin predicts, can you open up your fat cells and lose that weight? Um, when you push it down to a 70, you've now got glucagon. Glucagon is going to be a hormone that says, hey, you got any storage of that uh, sugar around? We might need some. And so you're really going to be emptying some of the storage. Um, epinephrine starts to rise at this point. Um, epinephrine is another way to say your energy or your mental focus will increase. Um, you get into those 60s and you can see pretty good data that says our norepinephrine is rising and so is growth hormone. Uh, in my book, one of the favorite chapters I have um, is on growth hormone and how to spark it, how to make it higher. I learned in medical school that that never goes up, but that is indeed not the case. And a ketogenic diet um, or a fasting re regimen, you can see that rise. So that's pretty cool. Um, next, you can see these are the two parts where I foreshadowed and said, now wait a minute. In uh, looking at cortisol as it rises, um, that is a stress hormone. That is your body saying, I think we might be getting in trouble here, and it will reach for even deeper uh, glucose storages when your cortisol rises. Uh, in fact, your cortisol is the hormone that surges about an hour before you wake up in the morning, and it tells the liver to release some glucose. So you can see that dawn effect of more glucose circulating because of this hormone cortisol. Now, that's not from a low blood sugar, that's from circadian rhythm and sleep patterns. Um, but finally, I tell, uh, I, this was in the literature, and I just put it in here to say, when you're not on a keto-adapted diet, you're going to look at this chart and say, she's crazy, there's no way you can stay awake at 55. And I would say that's just not true. Uh, when you look at keto adaption, you are awakening your brain to use ketones. And uh, it doesn't do it the first day, but boy, if you really give it some good doses of ketones, um, I've got another lecture out there showing we can adapt your brain in four days if you restrict carbs uh, significantly enough. Uh, if you put ketones available, um, that's been a, a fascinating uh, um education for me. I thought it took much longer to wake up those mitochondria in the brain, but if you rise the ketones in your blood, you can see those uh, little turkeys turn on in as little as four days. Um, all right, so let's get back to the focus of this, which is why is my glucose so high? And in a word, uh, it's called glycogen. Yeah, everybody's like, what? All right, so this is where, if you haven't bought the book, I'm going to give another plug for this because there's a, a chapter in the book that goes through this chart. And you may think this is a kind of a goofy chart, but this is my favorite chapter in the book. It is super science-y, but um, I really got so much better of an understanding of what is really happening in the different stages of a ketogenic diet um, and where do my patients run into trouble from this chart. So just slow down with me a little bit, and I want you to look at... Um, 
that I've got three fa or five phases there. The third phase is in blue, but I want you to focus on what's happening in the second phase. And try not to look at the numbers because this study was done when they strictly fasted people for 40 days. And they did a great job of measuring which things were working, when it was happening, what's the glucose per hour, what's their metabolism. Really great job um, of teaching us. It's, it's a really old study. I think it's like 68 or 72 that it came out, but it's I want to say it was out of Minnesota. Sorry, I don't have that in front of me, but it is in the book. <laughs> so if you are saying, Doc, I just don't understand why my sugars are so high. Remember that the ketogenic diet is other, otherwise called a fasting mimicking diet. So if I were to take you and put you in this study and you know, lock you up away from your carbohydrates and just have you salt and water fast, um, you would see that by uh, the end of the first day, you would have emptied your glycogen storage. So glycogen is this word that, um, that happens, that, that is stored sugar. Um, and I just want you to see the pattern that happens in phase two where the, where the, um, the curve for the glycogen goes up and then it starts to trickle down because it's all gone. Um, and then there's this dashed line that's happening that really peaks into that third and fourth phase, which is called gluconeogenesis. Uh, we're going to do gluconeogenesis in a different video. I'm going to really unpack glycogen for my insulin resistant patients in this video. And it's that phase two that's happening to them. So let's back up. Like glycogen is a word that is not glucose, but it kind of sounds like it. And glycogen um, is a, a collection. When, I'm, when I have my artist help me out, I tell them, okay, these are the shapes and the color I want them to look at with looking at glucose. And I specifically picked the different phases <laughs> that these little characters are at because glucose does give us energy, but it also makes us te sleepy. I almost put a flame on it, but I thought it would look like the insulin. Uh, it can get us inflamed, um, and our body works really hard to control glucose. Glucose is the easiest, fastest burning fuel. It's like, um, if, if you remember in the book, it, it shoots up really high and fast, but it's a short period of time that it provides energy. And um, we like having it around. So, you know, your body has done a good job of saying, you know what, that sugar is really high. We're going to tuck all these glu extra glucoses into a little ball and call it glycogen. And glycogen is what, what we would say the fastest response to um, to energy demand uh, when the sugars are low. So if you remember that hormone chart I went through a few minutes ago, glyco uh, glycogen um, or glucagon was the hormone that was produced when those sugars uh, slumped into the 70s. And uh, gluc glucagon says to release this glycogen. So it's a message saying, hey, I need some sugar. And so let's go to the message where that goes. Um, one of the places that this uh, the glucagon tells the storage to come from is your liver. So in your liver, you have several places where um, your body stores uh, glycogen. And if you look, uh, this next little part is going to be an example of what happens when these little glycogen balls start out as one, and then there's more, and then there's more, and then there's more. And if you, you several of my videos, I've talked about how the people in my clinic with the biggest livers are not alcoholics. They're diabetics. They're people who have been carb addicted and had high blood sugars and high insulin for the better part of like 25, 30 years. Their liver is two, three times the size it should be. And they are at the highest risk for cirrhosis of the liver. You add alcohol to their, their liver disease and bam, it's like throwing uh, gasoline on fire. They become cirrhotic and they are the number one reason why um, for, for transplants of the liver today is not alcoholic but is obesity associated with all this glycogen stored in there. So the other place it's stored is a muscle cell. And we're not going to go into that. We're going to stay focused on the liver today. When you look at the liver cells um, and that sugar gets low, um, here's a, a picture of your bloodstream. And we're going to pretend you're in a ketogenic uh, setting where you do have some ketones floating around in there. And I put some glucose in that blood bloodstream, but you've been fasting, which is why your glucose uh, or your ketones are higher. Um, you haven't eaten, let's say, in 17 hours. And your glucose is getting down there a little bit and your body says, hey, you know what? We've tucked away some sugar for a rainy day. And that's where you will start to see the uh, liver empty out these glucagon balls um, and really say, hey, these, this is the easy uh, 
the easy fuel to burn. And like, like, um, hopefully you know, but if you don't, I go through this in the book very adamantly, that if you line up a mitochondria and a glucose in front of a cell, cell um, that that glucose is going to sneak in front of the ketone nearly every time. You know, just recently I've done a video about how the brain actually can prefer to use ketones, but that is a rather new discovery of how we've uh, studied that and how we've looked at that. The rules of of time is we cannot have glucose is too high in our system. It is dangerous for excessive glucose. So that uh, glucose will always sneak in front of the ketone and um, uh, be burned before the, the, the ketone will. So when folks come in to me and say, you know, doc, I've been doing what you told and I'm in this weight loss stall. I don't, um, I've been doing your Dr. Boz ratio and I can't get my ratio under a hundred. Um, my ketones aren't bad. I, you know, 0.8, 1.2, but my sugars have been so high. Um, in the past, I've done this little, this little slide, which shows you that ketones do have some rules. Um, and there's good, better, best. I really like using those as teaching because people are in different chapters as they're learning about the ketogenic diet. There's ketones that last for two to three hours, ketones that last for two to four hours, and then those that last for days to weeks. And when you look at what those are, that includes your beta-hydroxybutyrate. I call those ketones in a can or exogenous ketones. The better ones are fats that specifically absorbed into the portal vein, and they're called MCT or medium chain triglycerides. Be very careful to check the label that it has C8 and C10 on it. You do not want C12. You do not want C6. I mean, C6 just tastes kind of funny. But C8 and C10 are the best ones. Um, they're also expensive. So if you get a cheap MCT, you know why. <laughs> um, the other one is the best one, though, is fasting. And really, that increases your metabolism, awakens that mitochondria inside the liver cells, inside the muscle cells uh, to, to burn ketones. And that, uh, that lasts beyond your fast. So, but today we're talking about glucose. And so if you look at your good, better, best for glucose, like how do you get your glucose down? Um, I thought this would be better approached um, for are you a newbie into the ketogenic diet? Are you at your first kind of weight loss stall or your first or having trouble? Or are you looking more at longevity? And so the good, better, best for glucose, I mean, the best glucoses are those, um, you know, around the 70s or 80s in your system. Um, keeping that glucose controlled. Uh, last night at the gala for these type 1 diabetics, the reason the title of that charity is uh, Let Me Be 83 is that is the best average for a growing kid uh, to, to keep their glucoses uh, at 83. So um, as adults, it could be even lower because <laughs> you're not growing, but um, you're also not, um, well, you shouldn't be growing. You're, you're probably growing the wrong direction. So let's look at the first one. Good. Good would be decrease your carbs to less than 20. This is really important. I've had people run into the problem saying, I'm doing everything you say, I'm doing everything you say. And then I look at, and their macros are really what they're looking at in percentages instead of measuring the 20 grams of carbs per day. And I'll tell you, I use this rule hard and fast. Um, I do not count, a, I mean, I count all fiber. So if you say, well, but I can subtract the fiber and get a few more carbs, do not play that game. You are going to find yourself in a pickle. Um, that, uh, that less than 20 carbohydrates a day and don't cheat by playing the fiber game. Uh, that's my recommendation. The second one, though, is uh, we talk about an eating window when they run into their first stall or the first time they say, you know, Doc, I'm checking all these sugars. I feel fine, um, but I'm not losing any weight. And, um, you know, they're getting frustrated. So that's when I'll start to talk about things like, all right, if you've been on this ketogenic diet for a couple of weeks or hopefully closer to six weeks is when I like to have this conversation they have limited their food already. If they've kept those carbs under 20 and really worked on finding satiety, finding that a, a high fat meal sends other hormones surging that really reward your brain, reward your energy, and shift your chemistry. And for an insulin uh, resistant patient, it's so important that this happens. Uh, that they really do spend those first few weeks not skimping on calories. You can get to that at a later stage. I need your chemistry fixed first. So important. When they skip this step, their metabolism continues to slow down and dwindle, and they really don't get to find the pleasure of what is found on a ketogenic diet. So this eating window is... Um, um, something I have them focus on. And most of the time, I start by saying, just eat when you're hungry. 
And many times, I, I remember when I personally walked through this with Grandma Rose, we skipped breakfast, which was kind of a we had to address our routine. We could still have our coffee. We tried to have black coffee and really have no calories until we felt hungry. And boy, uh, you could find yourself at one meal a day pretty darn quick. Um, it is a conversation that most people have to have out loud, though, that they don't realize, well, aren't you supposed to eat three meals a day? <laughs> Isn't that what you're supposed to do? And I would say that if you look back over the, you know, the mankind at time that well, that's that's really a modern day rule and it really has led to a lot of the obesity and a lot of this elevated sugars and elevated insulins so the second thing that you say well doc I'm already eating one meal a day uh, the next thing I would um, have folks uh, look at in that eating window is to remember that your circadian rhythm really does spark your metabolism Earlier in the video I talked about how cortisol rises when those sugars got low if you weren't keto adapt keto adapted. Cortisol is also that hormone that wakes you up in the morning with a surge of chemistry that tells your liver to release some of that glycogen. And out comes the sugar. This is the, I haven't eaten in hours. How can my sugar be high? Because your body got a signal from the chemistry team that said, hey, she's getting low on sugar. You want to release a couple of those little balls you stored of sugar? And out comes the storage. Um, the good news about um, eating window is most of the time patients don't need to focus on the circadian rhythm at the beginning of their eating window. They're working their way through how to eat one meal a day. Most of us choose that meal to be in the afternoon or evening. And then I would say if you're an evening eater and you're stalled or you're having high blood sugars, you have to start um, limiting your window before your circadian rhythm. So if you wake up at 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, your circadian rhythm went off about an hour or so before that. So that's really when your metabolism started. So let's say you wake up at seven, that means your circadian rhythm went off at six. So now if you subtract 12 hours from that, so that's six o'clock the night before, it would be my recommendation that you have no calories from six o'clock at night to six o'clock in the morning. And then if you choose not to eat in the morning, congratulations, that's fine, but don't, um, <laughs> Counting the window prior to the circadian rhythm uh, is the key to really rising to the next level of improving your metabolic health. Uh, your body released the glucose, and it did that because it's programmed to do that to wake you up. It doesn't mean stay in bed all day. It's still going to do that. It's still going to send a circadian rhythm, so that, that's not a hack. You can't like, skip it. But when you're finding your sugar's too high, it is the evening hours that people tend to eat or snack or even just add a few little almonds before they go to bed. Boy, that raises those, um, that insulin, that rate that sparks um, the storage team to, to wake up and you're gonna find yourself uh, with higher sugars than you want. The last thing I talk about to improve your glucose is I look at the word fasting. Yes, that F word. Um, again, I do not talk about this the first six weeks, maybe even eight weeks of a ketogenic diet. I want them figuring out how good they can feel on a ketogenic diet. And I want them not really checking their blood sugars until they get to these stuck points. Um, you know, when it comes to fasting, um, I really like them to address that, that 12 hour window before they do that first 36 hour fast. So if they're saying, I'm going to do a fast, I'm going to do a five day fast. I'm like, eh, put the brakes on. Don't do that. Um, I would recommend that you conquer your 12 hour pre circadian rhythm time, meaning limit the food from the time your circadian rhythm goes off until it, uh, 12 hours before you're going to wake up again. So I like your stomach to be empty by the time that 12 hour clock, you know, rings. Uh, so I like folks who are going to have a circadian rhythm at six o'clock in the morning. I'd like them done eating by 5:30 so that they can sweep that sugar and that food or whatever they eat into the intestines and that the stomach is truly empty for 12 hours before they wake up. And then the key is absolutely no snitching, no snacking, no gum, really important. If you need something, put a little salt under your tongue and do not, do not break through that window. Once you've conquered that 12 hour window before you wake up, then if you're still having high blood sugars. I mean, I've had people never need to fast. They really lost all the weight they needed. They got those sugars controlled because they followed that rule. Um, when you, if, if that's not how, if you're still having high blood sugars, um, one of the key uh, things is to do a 36 hour fast. And that sounds like a long time, but really you've got two, two nights of sleeping 
So you've got eight hours of sleep and eight hours of sleep. So 16 hours of that is sleeping. So really it's only a 20 hour fast. Um, the, um, the, the key though is um, that you really mentally prepare for that day. Um, I like to just make sure it's a busy day and then be sure to put some salt crystals in your pocket in case you get a crave of hunger on that 36 hour fast. But um, again, that's what Lackland did um, two weeks ago now and is again starting with me today. I try to do a fast every Sunday, so we're starting today. I point this out again because I don't recommend people check their glucoses and ketones when they first start a ketogenic diet. But when you get into some of these advanced lessons, it is a powerful transition to say, well, why aren't you losing weight? Don't, don't just tell me that. Show me the numbers. And I've had a few people want to reach out to me on, um, you know, with saying, can you help me? Can you help me? I'm like, if you're not checking numbers, uh, no one can help you. You need to help us. And boy, uh, I've got, <laughs> I've, I've promoted this uh, Foracare so many times, they've given me a promotion code that if you type in Dr. Boz, uh, DR period BOZ or DR space BOZ, either one of those should get you a 10% discount off of one of these um, after a, I think it's a one-time use from what I understand. I haven't used it myself, but that's what they tell me. Um, so if you're going to check your sugars, I really like this monitor um, because, boy, I don't have to use a strip twice. And it checks both glucose and ketones. I can't find it locally, but I got this uh, this tip from one of my patients and... Um, I have not been disappointed. So, uh, you, you know, this Dr. Boz ratio only starts if you're actually checking your numbers. So we're going to end with that saying, I want you to put your flames out of your, uh, out of your Mr. Insulin. And that means that your sugars need to go down and your ketones need to go up. And we like uh, Mr. Insulin. We just need him to not be so inflamed. But that, uh, that comes with um, a little bit of uh, uh, forward planning and then um, just persistence. So, um, having said all that, I uh, want to go through one more thing. You know, when I look at um, some of the things that I reach for every week, it is a Dr. Boz ratio of 40 or less. Um, the reason I'm doing that is I want autophagy in my own health, and um, it also provides a pretty good testimony and example for patients that it isn't just something you do when you're sick. I really think we eat too many times in a day. We eat way too much in a day. And as I'm raising teenagers and trying to help them with the best brains and the best health going forward, um, nothing like an example in the house that has uh, transitioned things. Uh, Lachlan has been on her journey now for four months and her son has lost almost 30 pounds. Um, it's just another testimony that says when you are, um, when you're changing behavior, your children, your support system is watching and we do really need the next generation to help get um, this obesity and this chronic disease management problem into the past and into a place where it's easy for them to see how, how we can improve that. But that starts with an example. So I am signing off. I just want to say if you, I am writing another book. So the way the first book got written is I was pouring into my mom. The way the second book is written is from your feedback. So if you liked this lesson or if you thought I'd hit it or didn't hit it, boy, leave me a comment. It's so helpful. Um, Writing a book means I see less patients, so if you haven't bought this book, uh, or if you know a friend that really does need help with their health, uh, it's on Audible, it's also on Amazon for Kindle or for the paperback, and it really does, is the best thing you can do to help support this channel for more videos and to help me get to the end of the second book, which <laughs> seems like forever away. So I'm signing off as Dr. Boz, improving your health one ketone at a time. I'll see you next week.